Uh, like about 11 or so. Okay. Welcome, Zoomers. This hybrid class is good. Uh, this is a very special class. Uh, and, it, and it talks a lot about not a specific situation, but a lot about who we are and who we are for you, what we do. And the agent hotline is a great example of this. Um, we put this together a, a number of years ago. And uh, I don't know how long it's been, what, two, three years? More than that. Right, longer than that, yeah. And, and the concept is to provide a resource for you so you know we've got your back and you can focus on your business. Uh, and we, I think we've not done as great a job as we should have of letting people know about it and making them aware of the resource uh, to be able to, to do it uh, and, and what it is. And, and in one of your things in here, you've got a number of things. It talks about the hotline, talks about who's on it, the quick question, the resource procedure, the timeline, uh, and basically Monday through Saturday, nine to nine, Sunday, 10 to nine. Uh, we have two of our, uh, what do you call it, panel members? Hotline persons, hotties, gurus, gurus, our gurus, gurus. Like hotties. Nick McCoy, Mark <laughs> Bean. Uh, and we have online Scott, are you there? Scott Shriver, right up there. Scotty. Waving at us. Uh, he's zooming <laughs> here. Where are you, Scott? I'm in Vail, Colorado. Vail, okay. We figured you're some great exotic place. Well, thank right. you well, for I'm taking time to be here. So, Nick, Marcia, and Scott, and also Joe Martins, who is evidently not available, are the four agents that you'll get when you call the hotline. And we're gonna talk about a little bit about what it is and, and what it's not. Um, but, but the concept is, is you have situations where you're not sure what you can do, what to do about it. Uh, and you, sometimes you know the answer, you just need a little confirmation. Uh, you, you really need to make use of this. I mean, you've got the number there, it tells you what the number is. And there's a procedure which we're going to talk about a little bit more in, in a few minutes uh, that Nick's going to explain to us uh, in really detail, good detail. <laughs> he said, Bob, you didn't tell me I had to talk. Okay. Um, and so we worked through it. But the, uh, <clears throat> the focus tends to be you got a contract question, offering things like that. But it's broader than that. I mean, really, it's almost in. When you're getting ready to do a listing and you're, you're not sure about some aspects of that, you're not sure about you know, can I hold off and, and not have it open yet until the weekend? And But I can go put an MLS now. Some of the coming soon rules, clear cooperation, things of that nature. Any of those kinds of things that deal with, you know, the real estate and the transactions, uh, you know, we're, we're there for, we're receptive. Um, you can ask those questions. And, and here's what you can be incredibly comfortable with. And, and comfort is an appropriate word. The person you talk to on the hotline, will have the answer or will know where to get the answer. Won't ever be, boy, that's a great question. We don't have a clue, you know, good luck. <laughs> and let's know how it works out. You'll, you'll get an answer or we'll find out who we need to talk to. It may be me, it might be Mike. Um, he tries to avoid me calling him, but it's, you know, our, our primary owner. Uh, we, we've got a lot of resources. One, one of the advantages of, uh, all my years of working with the Texas Real Estate Commission is, is I can call up Vanessa Burgess, the general counsel for track, Abby Lee, the deputy general counsel. I, I can call up, you know, actually the, the chair. Yeah, I mean, so, and so because we have some relationship, I'm calling get the official position. If we're losing something up there. Um, same thing with Texas Realtor. I mean, we have the advantage in this office of having the current chair of the Texas State Realtors, Texas Realtors, Marvin Jolly is in our office. Uh, Mike Brody is a former president of Texas Realtors. So we've got some people who are at high levels that we can have resources. So uh, when we don't have the answer, uh, we know where to go. Uh, and, and you'll find something. And, and that's something that should help build your confidence as you're dealing with people, uh, prospects, buyers and sellers, this landlord, people like that. Uh, should help you as you move through on all this. Um, and uh, I think you'll find that it, it makes a difference 
if you use it correctly with your clients, uh, and they understand you go through something. Because one of the things that you don't want to do is you don't want to get into a habit of just right off the top of your head coming up with an answer. Because it might not be the right answer. You want them to feel comfortable that you know how to go through the process. You, you, you know, there are a lot of variables. Um, I did a contracts class this morning for CCAR. We did it by Zoom. And uh, <clears throat> we dealt with the <clears throat> one to four family contract and several selected endo. And these are all forms. These are all forms we use all the time. One to four family, the denda. And so we go through and we dealt with three questions on these things. And these are, <clears throat> for the most part, experienced agents who are, you know, taking these classes for the renewal. And yet something new comes up every time. And they go, wow, I didn't know that about that addendum. I didn't know that about that. There are always variables <clears throat> we're dealing with people. And this will help you feel comfortable in working through all those variables. Perfect. And there's Miss Jill, our CEO leader person. <laughs> Thank you for coming by and attending. Um, and, and we just want you to feel comfortable and, and have your, help you. It'll help your clients feel comfortable that you you know what you're doing and you've got good credibility there. Um, now, and I want you to be patient with me on this. Um, Mike Brody is our leader. He's our OP. He's our majority owner, he's our designated broker. Um, and he's an incredibly nice guy. And he's always gonna be courteous and kind to you, operate out of curiosity. Um, and, and, and Mike won't ever get on you. Come on in, please. Grab some material. Uh, there's seats right up here on the front row. <laughs> uh, and, and he'll be nice to you. And he, he'll answer your questions and he'll lead you to good directions. Um, and he, he, he won't be unkind to you. That's not always the case with me. <laughs> now, I, I really sometimes, I show an enormous amount of restraint uh, because you'll, you'll come in with something and I go, where were we last week when we should have talked? Why are we now doing, we could have done something last week, we're buried now. And I, and I just, and, and, and the reason I get frustrated is I find myself thinking, where did I fail? by not getting you the right information and working through whatever. Um, so occasionally be patient with me as I'll get a little impatient and I'll go. <laughs> you haven't read the contract, have you? Uh, you, you, you didn't, you really, you know, uh, because my perspective on all this and, and my role in all this is compliance. I, I want us to be in compliance. Track um, <clears throat> with Texas Realtors, Code of Ethics. Uh, I, I, when, when we get sued, even though Mike is the name on the lawsuit, not mine, <laughs> uh, he hands it to me and says, Bob, take care of this. And, and that's fine. Because I know the attorneys, I know the know people, I work through the process. Uh, and, and, and so I, I deal with that all the time. And yet, that gives me a perspective for compliance. That, that, that I really need to make sure you've got what you need to be in compliance. And, and when you don't, I don't blame you. I blame me. Because there's something I didn't do that I should have done to make sure you understood how this works. Uh, so when I when I get a little impatient, I get a little frustrated, I recognize I'm getting impatient with me as we're kind of working through it. So be patient and sit back and say, okay, I'll let Bob vent a little and then we'll see what we need to do. Kind of work through that. Um, but one of the things that we'll talk about I don't know whether Nick or Marsh will talk more about this, is there's, there's a real fine balance that an office like ours does. An office that has an incredible amount of culture and support like we do, more so than anybody else I know. And I've been in this office, I guess, 21 years now. It'll be 21 years. Oh, it's 21 years September. And so I've been in this office, I've been in the broker business for a fifth year, but I've been in this office. And, and it's because we're good. We're really, really good at what we do. And we're good for our shades, for our agency. We work through that process. Um, but there's a balance there. As we do all the things we need to do to help you succeed in your business, we have to be careful that we don't do too much for you. Because then we become enablers. And, and one of the things we don't want to have happen, we want the hotline to be a resource 
that when you have something, you say, wow, gee, I wonder how that works. You know to call. But you'll see as we go through this, there's some questions that we'll want you to ask yourself before you call. You'll see there on the hotline question uh, procedures. And we want you to go through that process and know certain things. I had an interesting situation. It's been a couple of years, but it really stood out to me. Uh, I had an agent, one of our experienced agents, this is pre-COVID, so we're all here we're engaging like that. And uh, she was on the way to my office to ask a question. She said, Bob, a really odd thing just happened. I was getting ready to come to you with a question. And on my way to your office, an agent, a fairly new agent, asked me virtually the question I was getting ready to ask you. And you know what? I knew the answer. When the question was asked of me, I said, wow, here's how that works. And the reality is she was coming to see me so she didn't have to think through it. She didn't have to analyze it. She just quick answer, quick question, get it and go. And, and, and that's not where we want you to be. We want you to have the resource. We want you to think through it. We want you to take the time to look at it, to ask yourself some questions. In a few minutes, we'll go through that. So there's a balance between us making sure you've got the resource, but us encouraging you to think through your situations because frankly, most of them, if you sit down and really think through and ask questions, you know the answer. Uh, you know, one of the most common responses I get, Marshall, you can probably do too. Okay, I, I know the answer. I just wanted to confirm. I just wanted to make sure I was on the right track. It turns out you probably did know the answer. If you worked through it. So, you know, we, we want to work through that, that fine balance and make sure that we give you what you need to be able to do your business. All this stuff, all my all my battling with attorneys and keeping us out of courts of a cat, that's invisible to you. you. You need to build your business. You need to work your business. You need to know that's being taken care of somewhere. Um, and we're not going to bring you into it until, until your name is on the suit. <laughs> and then we'll work on that. Uh, to go through that. So as we go through this, now as we talk about this, uh, and, and Zoomers, I want to make sure, even though you're kind of to my back here, I guess up here on the that you feel comfortable unmuting yourself and asking questions. And, and Scott, we want you to feel comfortable as we talk about everything to be able to add to it and say, okay, it's think about this. Um, so as we work through this, uh, I want uh, both uh, Marcia and Nick to kind of give us a sense of some of what they experience in the calls. So you've got uh, some ideas of the type of things that we find ourselves uh, addressing and dealing with. Uh, so you can feel comfortable and say, well, I was going to call about this, but it was a really, really dumb question, so I shouldn't call about that. The problem, you know what dumb questions lead to? Dumb questions that are not asked and don't get answered to end up in a track complaint and a lawsuit. So ask the dumb question. Uh, you will never hear from any of us, wow, that was really dumb. <laughs> now, we might think it. <laughs> but we're not going to say it. We won't say it. We won't tell. I can't believe you didn't know that. Uh -huh. So always be comfortable when you're asking the question. So, no, that's good. what was that, Marcia? So we're not supposed to say that. <laughs> <laughs> that's your insight. Oh, sorry. No, you know, you, you, we, we got a couple things in our offices, and, and you know, and we do it a little bit in jest. And what's the one you got says, "Yes, please let me drop everything else I'm doing to handle your problem." <laughs> And I've got I've got a little thing in my office in the back that says uh, says I'll be nicer yes I'll be nicer if you'll be smarter so, <laughs> but we we do it in jest I've, I've made a recommendation right now I, I asked before all the team leaders before we haven't done it yet I know we've got some space limitations but we need a room just a little room with padded walls. <laughs> So occasionally, one of us can go in there and just bang our head up against it, you know, and it's a nice and quiet soundproof to work through that. Uh, so, Nick, what kind of things are you experiencing for the most part to help everybody feel comfortable with? Yeah, here are good questions that we have. Anything that jumps out in your mind? You know, it, it runs the gamut. Um, it spans everything from a negotiating question when somebody says, well, can the other side really <laughs> ask me for this or can I ask my clients to do this to what would be a a uh, fairly straightforward contract question, you know, having to do with dates or if I did this and we didn't have the initial to get, you know, when do I start my time for this? So, I mean, I, I'd say it's, it's both. Um, also going for a listing, uh, we'll get questions about what do I need to have prepared? What do I need to take with me? Sometimes if they look up on the tax records and they see one name, but they weren't told about another name that shows up on there and 
So those are, those are you know, if you haven't run into that before, then, you know, how are they supposed to handle that? Um, a lot of, uh, a lot of appraisal questions, not as much anymore, but. So more the very first thing you talked about, can they ask that? Can they ask sure. us that? Or are some things that you can ask? Uh, what's your thought? I mean, what do you find uh, sometimes, are there some things that say, gee, can they even ask me that? I, I think so. I mean, yeah, you've been asked that, right? Um, so, uh, <laughs> she'll always do, she'll she'll always do that too. Wow, you. that's awesome. They'll leave you hanging. Leave me hanging out there. There's certain things that, can I put this in special provisions? Those type oh. of things. <laughs> you know, how do I, verbiage. And the answer verbiage. is no. <laughs> <laughs> always no special provisions. Just put a big piece of duct tape right over the top of it. Don't use special let's, yeah. take, well, let's take, for example, uh, you're the buyer's agent and the listing agent you know, we'll, we'll ask you, a good listener will always ask you some questions. Is your buyer another offers? Is your buyer another contract? Does your buyer have a house to sell? Uh, who's your buyer's lending? Things like that. And so uh, when you think about that from a buyer standpoint, you go, wow, can they even ask me that? Well, except for things that are illegal and discriminatory, there's no limit to what they can ask you. What you need to have done as a good buyer's agent is already have had those conversations with your buyer and say, here's what a good listing agent is going to want to know. So right up front, we need to address it. We need to let them know what's going on. We need for them to feel comfortable that you're committed to this property uh, or that you're not doing this now. The market has changed. Even the multi-offer you know, offer situation we've got, it's not the, the death trap it used to be if a buyer is you know, they're offering <coughs> other offers contracts because we understand why they're doing that in this market. Uh, but, but you're going to get those good questions as you work through it. Now, we also have some challenges, some things that have just happened recently. Uh, recently, I mean, in the last month, uh, we've had three transactions in which it turns out after the fact, in one case, literally the day before closing, that seller can't close because they don't really own the property. Uh, there's an estate situation. There's a will. There's a, you know, and, and, and we, we had the buyer in that situation. And the listing agent didn't do a good job of making sure their seller really could sell the property. We're finding ourselves having to ask questions. We're finding ourselves looking for little red flags. You know, when you've got the buyer, check the tax roll. You know, look for little things that are that are that don't match up and start asking questions. Uh, in this one situation, we had a different name as a seller in the contract and a different name on the seller's closure notes. Well, that's a signal. As some say, whoa, why, why are those? Two different people. And is it going to find out that, you know, there was a death in the family and, and we had that worst of all possible air situations. We had children from a previous marriage. And the father, who was the survivor, had no clue that his children from a previous marriage, one of them he had never even talked to in 10 years, had rights to the property. Oh, I don't think so. I don't think, well, she did. Uh, and so we have to work through it. So we've, we've got to start asking questions about what's going to look for those little things, those little signs. When there's any hint that someone may have died, uh, we start asking questions. We start saying, you know, hey, what have we got here? Uh, because when you start getting into that, uh, the challenge for our buyer client is they spend time, energy, and money on a property they can't buy. And, and in this one situation happened in our Rockwell office, the tile company is telling us, they won't be able to issue any title to do anything for four years. Now, we're going to other title companies to find out whether that's really correct or not. But right now, with that title company, that, is, that deal's dead. Wow. And so we're trying to work through it and deal with that. Uh, so, you, so you're right. As you work through that, we've got we to ask questions. And you, you need to feel comfortable. Maybe it's too strong a word. But you, but you need to be okay with uh, questions from the other side. And some questions on the other side show there's a really good agent on the other side. That's a good sign. That, that they know these are important things for their seller to know. Same thing when you've got a listing and a buyer's agent asks certain questions about you and your seller, don't, don't take it personally, don't get offended. That's a good agent on the other side that wants to know what's going on. Because the, the ultimate question in every contract that we deal with is the seller, in paragraph one of the contract, really the person who can come to title and convey title, come to closing and convey title. Is that really who that is? In fact, when you go out on a listing and, and you might do it kind of with a smile, say, okay, now, great property. I really am going to enjoy working with you and I want to list your property. And just tell me off the top of your head, what makes you think you have the right to sell the property? 
what makes you think you have you can come closing and convey title? Because reality is, some sellers think they can and they can't. And so, you know, you, you're going to look for real signals about that. You're going to hear them talk about um, how sad they are that their spouse passed away. Oh, I'm sorry to hear that. When was that? What was yesterday? Whoops. And you have to have conversations about, whoa, what do we got there? Uh, Marshall, what kind of things are you seeing? Did you have something you wanted to follow up with that on, Nick? Well, I just wanted to say, so on, on those questions, so if you're on the listing side of things and you get a buyer's agent on the other side, like we would be in act asking those questions of, are you working any other offers? Are you, you know, the, the things that you may not be able to answer yet or vice versa. If you haven't had specific um, permission from your client, buyer or seller to answer those questions, that's an okay thing to say. Because yeah. if you don't want to, you don't want to spill the beans about something that you need. If you need the time to kind of pause and think about whether or not you should be releasing this information to the agent on the other side of the deal, say, you know what, that's a really good question. I would answer it, but I don't think I have specific permission from my client to answer that yet. So why don't I just make sure of that before I get back to you? I like that answer. Yeah, it is good. So, and 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 on the situation where you're asking uh, about other offers and things like that. Um, the way you word those things can, can be really valuable. Uh, you can even have a conversation like you're listening, you kind of want to know what's one of the buyers says, well, what a crazy market we got in it. And I mean, you know, it's just things going on. Buyers get so desperate, they're, they're making offers on multiple properties. I, I, I bet your buyers do that. I mean, I, I bet you're experiencing that, aren't you? You're kind of giving them, making it easy for them to tell you, not being confrontational. Um, because we, we want to have those good relationships as you work through it. It's one of the reasons, as a listening game, when you've got multiple offers, do everything you can to communicate to the other side uh, and, and keep that communication going. Uh, the number one challenging phone call that I get is the battle between agents. It happens more than all the rest combined. Battle between agents. And, and it's something that could be avoided. I mean, the really good agents who I hardly ever hear from are really good at establishing great relationships with the agent on the other side. They have good transactions because they keep those relationships going. When you let those little relationships drop, when you begin to find yourself having to preach to the other side and train them and tell them how it really works, um, that's when you create problems. And, and, it, and it, it really hurts your client. And it creates a situation that just blows through and just makes it bad. So, you know, even even when the other side is really being a toad, don't you know, take the bait. Be nice. Work through the process because that's that's a challenging situation. One of the things that all of you know at some level, or you will if you don't, is my attitude about intermediary. I don't like it. I've seen too many cases with lawsuits and things like that where it's a real disadvantage. I've got one going on right now. Time to be in Rockwall office, but where the client. Uh, the buyer who has sued both our agents and the seller and the title company uh, said to us, says, you know, I don't understand why Keller, why can't you care? But you got both sides. You got the whole thing. Why, why, haven't, why can't you fix it? They don't understand the two agents, one appointed, the other appointed, and don't understand how it works. What they see is us. They see us on both sides. Uh, so it's a real challenge. Now, the silver lining for an intimate relationship is both agents are us. Better train, good agents, it should be a better transaction because it's us, because we're on both sides. And so we really should be in a better position uh, because we have been better trained. We really know how to make this work. We know how to make sure that people understand what they're doing in it as you kind of work through that. Uh, Marsha, so what are you? So I get a lot of amendment questions. Where do I put this? How do I phrase it? Uh, can I even put this on there? those type of things. Um, the appraisal addendum, I probably get questions three or four times a week. Appraisal addendum. That's on a slow week. <laughs> a lot, a lot. Um, how, do I, how does my client terminate, whether they have the buyer or the seller? That quite often as well. Um, seller wants to terminate because they don't like the buyer anymore. Not <laughs> unfortunate, but that's really not grounds for termination. So Just suck it up and yeah. get over it. Exactly. Exactly. Um, extending the option period is another one, you know, um, where to put the, that correctly. I mean, if it's in one through eight on the amendment, that's where it goes. If you don't see it in one through eight, then it goes to the other modifications, number nine. So there's a reason that those first eight exist and live there on that amendment. 
And I see things like that all the time where one of the eight yeah. is in special modifications. You bring up a great point, extending the option period. And you and I talked about this. It's number six on the amendment form. And you know, in the contract, the change that happened this year in the contract is the option fee and the earnest money go to the escrow agent. Of course, there's money with the escrow agent for it, but now the option fee goes to the escrow agent. Except when a buyer wants to extend the option period and pay an additional option fee, that goes to the seller. It doesn't go to the escrow agent. Thanks, Mike. <clears throat> uh, and, and, and because that's what it says in the amendment. And so we talked about, well, is, that seems inconsistent because in the contract, option fee goes to the escrow agent. So why is it not consistent in thing? Well, it's because the title companies told the broker lawyer committee, it's usually a dollar or $10 or something like that. We don't want to deal with that. We'll just pay that to the seller. We, we don't want to mess with That's not going to be changed. You know, that is what it is. Uh, and we see and understand that's, that's what the amendment says and that's where the money needs to go to. Even though my opinion is they, they should suck it up and take the dollar, that's not what happened. <laughs> They didn't listen to you. No, they didn't ask me for my input on that. So that was our disagreement. Hey, Bob, can I add one thing? Yes, sir. So uh, just sort of going back to what you were talking about, communication, cooperating with other agents, like what we found is uh, total agreement with that is we have been able to work through some very complicated transactions because we had a good relationship with the agent on the other side. And there was a sense of cooperation. H having said that, it's interesting because there, there's a tendency among agents to, to wanna help the other agent, to be nice to the other agent. We always wanna be nice to the other agent. But there are times where we found that an agent on the other side will is willing to give us information that they probably shouldn't because they were just trying to be nice, if that makes sense. Information that was more confidential. Obviously, if we're representing one party, that's great information for us, and we're happy to pass it along. But that's one thing I wanted to add is it's, we always want to be careful. We certainly want to be as cooperative and helpful with the other agent as possible, but we don't want to, do, we, we don't want to be nice at the expense of communicating something to the other side that is not in our own client's best interest. Yeah, you're exactly right, Scott. You have to be careful because sometimes you may get information that's so detrimental that if that agent's client finds out about it, it could totally blow the deal. Uh, so, you know, you, you take the information and you, re and you realize that often you're getting that information because it's the it's agent being helpful. We see this in a potential multiple offer situation where the listing agent has been very helpful to the buyer's agent. In some cases, you know, they've got five offers, but uh, agents will show a preference for other agents. And so you may have a past experience with this agent. You've got a good relationship. And frankly, they'd really like to see their seller in a contract with your buyer. And so they may be providing you good information about, you know, I can't really tell you but you know, it probably would be good for your buyer if they were somewhere in the 800 to 850 range. Or just, oh gosh. Just, just, you know, just throwing out numbers. You do whatever you want to do. And they do that. And, and we understand that. And, and it's in those cases, it can absolutely be to our client's advantage. You have to be careful as, as you go through that. You know, we could, at some point in time, we could take the high road and say, I understand this is okay because this is a really good listing agent. And they've got clearance from the seller to do that. And if that's the case, everything's good. And we can presume that's the case. So you're absolutely right. And uh, it's one of those things, I, I joke about this sometimes, that the most effective risk management tool in our business is for you to be likable. If people like you, they don't sue you. They don't apologize. I mean, that's just the way it is. Be likable. And this is exactly, Scott, what you're talking about, that if the agents like each other, they're working together, they're going to solve problems. And they're going to help their clients and go through the process. And, and that being likable makes such a huge difference as you work through it. That's why it works for us. Barbara's extremely likable. I'm yeah. extremely <laughs> and, I, and I love the way that you you help her establish those relationships. You stay in the background and crunch the numbers. That's a smart move on your part, Scott. 
Well, you I know, only say that with a little bit of a smile, a little bit of a jest, because we all love, we all love, you know, barbecue is just wonderful. Uh, <laughs> and, and you know what? I, I do find every once in a while I make that joke when I'm in, I'm sitting around with several of our female agents, and they look and say, "Well, we like Scott too." <laughs> so you've got a fan club out here somewhere. <laughs> 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 hey, Barbara. There she is, having a great time. Okay, so what else are you guys fighting? So I would also say, conversely to that point, that agents will take a, a deal as well if they are not nice to each other. Um, sometimes it's the agent telling their client, "This seller is awful. They are, you know, doing this, doing that," or the buyer said, you know, and that causes a lot of friction between the parties who don't even really know. They're just going by what their agent. Mm -hmm. has to say and deals will end they'll terminate based on friction between the parties because of that mm -hmm. so you know it's our duty to communicate with our client but not to give them all that bad stuff background necessarily we don't want to make the other side look like you know they're as bad as they are because it's our job to protect our people because yeah, your client will begin to react emotionally yes. to what's going on and not make good decisions as they work through it your job is to act as that buffer, working through it and help them feel good about the transaction uh, moving forward. So to the degree which you, and, and plus, uh, it, it's a violation when you start telling your client bad things about the agent on the other side, you're in violation of Article 15 of the Code of Ethics. So you can't go down that road. I'm, I'm dealing right now with an ethics complaint for one of our agents, actually it's an agent who's moved on to another KW office sent the broker you know no idea or something you know. <laughs> but but it's, it's one of those things that uh, he, he was really getting all over the other agent that he only way past when he should have so yeah you, you have to be careful about doing that because you you just need everybody to feel good about the transaction um and make some don't, don't you know the whole checklist of things that you shouldn't be doing and work through those relationships don't preach to the other side don't tell them how it should be done. Uh, don't let your ego get in the way. Because uh, the second you do that, I mean, it's going to get in the way of the transaction. Uh, and it doesn't protect your client as you work through it. Just, you know, be nice. Even when it doesn't appear to be appreciated from the other side, it doesn't matter. Because it's all about, you know, you doing the things you know you should be doing. If y'all want another script for maybe you see paperwork come repeatedly come back from the other side, incorrect or missing things or just not they don't understand the form even sometimes instead of going well you're an idiot you filled this out wrong it's this it's obviously this um i i tend to say something to the effect of you know what i noticed something on here that's going to get flagged by our compliance department they always say that this needs to be this way because of this reason so um would you take a look at this and see did you really mean this and if so can you send that back over so i blame bob <laughs> so you know and it's not it's not me saying you really, mm -hmm. I expected more out of you. <laughs> you yeah. should have known how to fill this out. You filled it out incorrectly. It's, you know what, I've got something here that on our paperwork, it's a clerical thing, but it gets flagged every time it comes through. So or, I blame Marsha for anything. Uh, well, yeah. <laughs> Marcia too. Is me. <laughs> yeah. Or lay it off on your client. I'm not sure my buyer totally would understand what's there, so right. kind of help me with it. Like, yeah. Just work and through it. More and, often than not, they're like, oh, that was on the second form that I was, uh, yeah. it was a different offer, and now I... Oh, yeah. Needs to be this way, sure, sure, sure. Okay. but regardless, it lets yeah. them save face. It lets the, the relationship continue without you being a know-it-all and letting them know exactly how. You know, Unless you are a know-it-all, and then if you are a know-it-all, it's a burden. Yeah. <laughs> that was good. That was a softball, but you got a real experience. That's, That's a great point. I will say a lot of times as I'm doing transaction coordinating, I will notice things come across and they are totally wrong. And I am I'm not very good. About, about <laughs> not about be you're not being I'm nice not, about it? I'm not nasty about it, but I'm not very nice about, you know, hey, maybe you really meant to do this. I'm usually the one who's saying this is the way it needs to be done, and more of a teaching aspect mm -hmm. than a, and I'm probably come across as bad. Are you doing that to our agent? So schmoozing is everybody. Strong suit then, Marsha. Huh? Yeah. Yeah, like okay, so you understand when you get this as one of our agents from Marsha, <clears throat> she's doing it to help you. Mm -hmm. and so yes. you appreciate it. So thank you very much, Marsha. I forgot how big an idiot I am, so thank you for helping me get <laughs> Thank you for reminding me. I never call anybody an idiot to their face, ever. Ever to their face. <laughs> <laughs>
And that's good, because you shouldn't do that. I, I would agree with that. It's a very good thing. Um, but it is, it is a challenge as you work through it. Um, because there are agents, and, and this happens in a lot of different situations, where there are standard things you see in blanks. And they just put them, they just put those numbers, those days or whatever in blank over and over and over again without thinking through and say, okay, what goes this blank is my client's decision. And here are the variables and we need to talk about 10 days in there, hundred dollars in there, you know, what should go in there. And they don't because it's easier to just, you know, click, 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 here's what goes, here's what goes as you deal with that. Um, it's just for example, and it's because we got a couple of lender persons here. Uh, where are we, folks? Where are we, folks? Wait, we got Dominic. And What's going on, guys? Hey, everyone. Thank you very much. Colton and Dominic. And so, one of the things in third party financing, you know, buyer approval, there's a blank for a timeline. People put standard time frames in there. And the reality is one, you want to look at the transaction. You know, as a buyer's agent, you look at what's going on. What do you have to do to make this an attractive offer? And for the seller, the shorter the time frame, the better it is. For the buyer, may need a longer time frame. But, but if whatever way you go, after you look at the market and the negotiation position the buyer has, it's the buyer's lender. And the buyer's lender says, yeah, based on this buyer, based on their circumstances, uh, here, here's what we can do. You know, we, we could, on this conventional loan right here with the 20% down they've got, yeah, we could do this thing in 10 days or 12 days or whatever. Or for this buyer who's self-employed and you got a business and we need additional documents, we're probably looking at 30 days. We're probably looking at a different timeline. But those are variables that we get from the buyer's lender. So when we put numbers in there, if there's any question from the listing side, say, wow, you got 21 days in here. You got 30 days in here. What's going on? Well, let me explain to you what. And, and make sure that you have had that conversation with the buyer's lender because a good listing agent is going to call the buyer's lender and say, talk to us about that buyer. Talk to us about how you end up with these time frames and these situations. And a good lender, in fact, a good lender, when they get that loan from one of our agents uh, on the buyer side, they're going to call the listing agent and say, let me tell you about our buyer. And that's huge. And that just makes such a difference as we work through it. And we thank you for doing that. That's good. It's a work good. These are great resources that when you're trying to put together a deal and you need information on financing and what works, and uh, talk to our in-house lenders. They're just right there around the corner and they're available. Um, Make sure you get it. Hello, Jana. What's up? Pete? You escaped for a few minutes. I did. Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> We're just talking about the hotline stuff and how people give good information and work through this. And, uh, you know, you, you can imagine different sides of the same coin, Marsha and Nick. Uh, that Marsha <laughs> says, <laughs> Marsha says, in all, all cases, you want to be extremely nice, very patient. Very understanding, which is just okay. her personality. That's how she is. And Nick said, let's get the deal done. I want to get this. Come on. Sadly, she's laughing. She knew exactly that you were going to even finish the sentence. So, Nick's from Auburn. <coughs> how you guys doing this year? Eh. 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 Quarterback can't decide if he wants to play or not. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the question so far as we get ready to go into some of our forms here. Any questions? You might have anything. Okay. Has any, wait, real quick. Yeah, Has everybody in here programmed the hotline number into their phone? Yep. Who has not? Uh, if you have not, phone up to it. Please do that. Please do it right there. It's right there. Call it KW Hotline. And you not only have a hotline, you've also got an email. Yep. Hotline in there. Yeah, that's new to me. I didn't have Yeah. That. So the email can be the, the, just know that when you call the hotline, it, it's going to be the Google voice thing where you says, you know, say your name and you say your name. And then the person who's, who's on the, the hotline will pick up and hear the name and then hang up because they don't want to talk to you. No, they, <laughs> no, they'll, sorry, secrets That's what behind does. the curtain. No, honestly, if there's, if they're not available, please leave a message on that, but know what to expect when, when you're being called back. That's what the quick question form is for. So after you do that and you email that helpline thing, the little form is going to come back saying, hey, here are all your questions. Make sure you, you can speak intelligently to that sooner rather than later, because that'll help move the conversation along quicker. So know who you represent, know what form you're talking about, have the scenario ready to go and, and all that. So those, those would help us to help you greatly. 
Um, and um, what else on that future part of things? Slow down a little so that we have a chance. <laughs> Slow down a lot. Yeah, please. Yeah. And it's, I mean, you know, you, you've been thinking about this for quite a while. It's probably been burning and churning and everything like that. For us, we're, we gotta, we got to start where we have to start. So if we ask you questions that you think we don't need to ask you, because we haven't been in your brain for the past like five days. So we don't, we need to get caught up on that stuff. So be patient with us and, and we will do the same. And to add to that, we only know what you tell us, right? So if you forget the first part of that whole transaction and you come to take us to the middle and we don't know about the other history of it or what's going on, we can only answer based on the information we have. So there are times that Nick has been wrong and that's because <laughs> <laughs> he wasn't given all the information up front. Yeah. Marsha has never been one. I was once. 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 Uh, Scott, anything you need to add on that that you can help them on helping us help them? No, I, I, I uh, agree with everything you guys have said. Uh, I, and I agree it's very helpful uh, if you don't get a, if no one answers is to leave a detailed message because that does give us a chance to process the information because you know, the people on the hotline, they're out doing things and in crowded restaurants or with the client. And so, uh, yeah, be as detailed as you possibly can. And I would say call the hotline. I, we, we should, I think the agents, we should be using it a lot more than we do. With the size of our office, I get less calls than I guess I expected to get. So that's what it's there for. So, and, and I agree, just reinforce, um, uh, if you have a concern, that's the time to call. Don't wait until you, you're you sort of down the road. Uh, give us a call, we can walk through it. Really like when I talk to an agent that has thought through it and they, they're they saying, this is what I think, this is what I think we should do, what do you think? I think that uh, helps accelerate the knowledge of the agents and certainly makes our job easier. Great. Great. Now we've got a yes, question. Yeah. yeah. Uh, in the third party financial agenda, if the buyer uh, signs uh, the number one fully, fully waiver, if the appraisal. You signs the appra use the appraisal addendum? Yeah, appraisal addendum. Okay. Uh, if the, if, if the uh, appraisal results come out, if it it's have a big uh, big gap. Big gap it's low. Yeah. Okay. Uh, the buyer could uh, the buyer could choose uh, give up it just to lose the earnest money or or uh, whatever the buyer need buy this house. So you're saying if it comes out low and the buyer has appraised has done the appraisal denim, he's waived the appraisal issue, so he doesn't get to terminate on that specific thing. But you're saying the buyer could say, okay, I'm going to just give up the earnest money and move on. Yeah. Okay. Now. Uh, this, this is a really good point. I um, expect you get some of that question like, a buyer don't want to do the deal, how does he get out of it? And you go through all the contentions. Here's the reality. If the buyer's not going to perform according to the terms of the contract, you're absolute every time, no exceptions ever, in writing, such as an email, you've got to say to that buyer, you need to seek legal counsel. You need to have an attorney tell you here your rights and responsibilities are the terms of the contract because it could be more than losing the earnest money. The seller can sue them. They have to be familiar with paragraph 15, the default paragraph, uh, they could be in big trouble. It's, you get a really bad seller, vindictive, and he thinks that you're fraudulent, and okay, I mean, you could be, in, so if they need to, they've got to talk to a good real estate attorney to know what their rights are as you go through that process. Because just walking away from it, say here's the earnest money, whatever, most of the time that's gonna work, but not all the time. But your buyer needs to understand what their rights are. You know, there's a nice balance between the legal issue of good advice from an attorney on the right, because as they move forward, we'll operate under the instructions of our client who is giving us instructions under advice of counsel. If they don't have an attorney, we, it's okay for us to say, here are the provisions in the contract, here are the different rights so that you have to terminate the contract, and here's what could happen. I mean, you, you know about the obvious ones, the option, the homeowner association, self-disclosure, financing, things about it. You know about those. Hey, here are your rights. And by the way, closings in two days, all those are gone. All those in contract are gone. 
So at this point in time, you, you have no more under the terms of the contract or the end of the contract, you have no more automatic rights termination that you can make use of. You need some advice of counsel because it looks like, I, I, you can't tell them that's the case, but it looks like you may be about to be in default. And if they're going to be in default, it's paragraph 15, which is a legal issue. You don't ever get to say to your client, if you do this, you're in default. Because that's that's a legal issue. Default is a legal term. You can say, you know, if you do this, it appears that you're not performing according to the terms of the contract. You need to talk to an attorney to find out what the consequences, what could happen to you. Does that kind of semi-answer as you work through that? Does that help? Does that answer that? It's really helpful, but I'm not in this situation, but I think it will. Oh, but it, it, ha it happens a lot. Yeah. A lot. Yeah, yeah. So, so, a lot. So, so another thing to save into your phone might be real estate attorneys. <laughs> yeah. I'm, I'm, and I'm being dead serious. Y'all okay. put, put one or two, put Kelly Milligan, put Charles Kramer, put mm -hmm. who, so many of our other fine title attorneys and who they recommend. Um, and so that when that time comes and you say, uh, I think you're gonna to wanna to talk to an attorney, they may say, I don't have one. You don't want them going to Yelp. <laughs> you, can say, you can say, our offices work closely with these people in the past. Here are yeah. several, please call, go with that. So. so we have two groups of attorneys that we can have as resources. One, Many times it'll be one of the title company attorneys we deal with. Mm -hmm. You can help out. Charles Kramer, Kelly Milligan, Don Moore, people like that. Uh, the other is there are a group of attorneys who have represented us in you know, cases and other situations. Uh, people like Robert Miller, for example, uh, Mark Davis, people like that who have represented us. And because of the relationship, they'll at least talk to our client. They'll say, okay, I understand what you've got. Uh, here's here's are your options. Here's what you can do. And if you decide to move forward with the litigation, here are your potential costs. And so they would provide you know with information because we know that there's another group of attorneys that we have kind of a more casual relationship. Um, Chase Care is one of them. Um, and here, is that Chase Care? I'm not sure anyway. It's, it's one that Cheryl McCarter has used a number of times. She used with one of her recent. But there's some of those attorneys that we kind of have a, a little less of a strong relationship and they'll still talk to our client. And in every case, when we give our clients uh, some of those names, we say, okay, here's some people we've had experience with. Uh, we're not telling you to use them. You need to do your own research as you work through it and always tell them to use our name. So the people know why why they're calling, you know, Charles Frank. Say, well, okay, good. I, I talked to Marsha and Nick and, and here's what I've got. And they suggest I call to you. Um, Charles has been very good about being available even on weekends. Uh, he's, he's been very helpful. Um, he's, he does most, he and his partner, um, Hunter, or Hunter, do most of Republic Title's paperwork. And he's just the most past chair of this broker lawyer committee on the attorney side. And so he's, he's very helpful. But those are people that, that you can make use to and as a resource. Now, you do need to know it's actually a violation of the rules of the Texas Real Estate Commission. You cannot pay attorney's fees for your client. You're not allowed to do that. So if they say, well, we, we, we figure you're our agent and you're our advocate and you can help us out and, and you can take care of this. No, I can't. Violation of my license. I can have action taken against my license for doing that. It's actually a violation of the rules of track, and it is. So you say, you know, normally I would do this, but here won't let me. Which I think is, by the way, is a pretty good rule. You should yeah. kind of work through that. Um, Anything else before we go into some of these questions here? So go, go to the form um, that says hotline questions procedure. It's got the number there. And I, I, as I suggest, I would suggest you have it on your speed dial, have that, uh, that hotline number. I would, I would really, as long as you can answer these questions, I would encourage you to make use of the hotline. Uh, you'll find that it not only is a valuable resource, but it makes you think. It really makes you think through situations and, and, and you'll find you'll be amazed at how you know more than you think you do. I mean, you really do. And you'll say, wow, I'm pretty good. I have no idea I was that good. Uh, so, and it gives you a little bit of one of the others that talks about the procedure and kind of thing that Nick just talked about. 
And it talks about your help uh, gmail.com, which you can send something to and get that. So at the very beginning, and what these are, these are questions that before you call us, ask yourself these questions. Be prepared to give the hotline person this information. And the first one is who you represent. Because who we represent can change the answer dramatically. Uh, buyer, <laughs> seller, or both. So if you're in an intimate relationship, we absolutely need to know that right up front. I mean, just as soon as possible. And we need to know that if we're in a relationship, hopefully it's a correct one that there's, you're representing one of the parties and somebody else in our office representing the other, that you're not sitting in the middle representing both. Because you won't be doing that until you had a conversation with me or Mike. That'll, that'll have to happen before you do that. Uh, so who do we represent? Now, give me a sense of, because it kind of is one of the things, well, gee, well, it, it kind of makes sense. How big a deal is it for us to know as we're trying to answer your question, who we represent? Why is that a big deal? Why is it important? Do what? It's like everything, if you're the, whether you're the buyer or seller, it's different. Um, well, think, think, yeah, it is, it is everything, but think about some of the questions that you might ask <laughs> about going through a process uh, about some aspect, you know, like, you know, you may say, okay, I'm looking at the survey paragraph, paragraph 6C, and I'm trying to think through this. I'm trying to decide, uh, should we use an existing survey or buy pay for new and sell pay? Well, before I answer that, I'd like to know who do we represent? Right. If we represent the buyer, my advice is always, we want a new survey. Now, if you've got negotiating leverage on the buyer side, let's get a new survey and have a sell pay for it. If you're just trying to make a really attractive offer in a multiple offer situation, go to 6C2 where the buyer pays a new survey and the buyer pays for it. Now, if you're going to have your buyer obtain a survey and buyer pay for it, give yourself plenty of time for the new survey. Because if your buyer orders up a survey and the deal falls apart, they've got a survey, they're going to pay for it. And in paragraph 18 of the contract, the title company if your buyer is getting their earnest money back, your title company, the title company will take the cost of the survey out of the earnest money before they give it back to the buyer. Yes, sir. What's a good time frame? Okay, so it depends a little bit on when the closing is, but I think at least 20 days. I think your buyer ought to have, if, if you've got a closing in 30, 45 days uh, and, and you're looking at, especially if you've got a country property where your survey may be several thousand dollars. You don't want to find yourself, you know, we just had one out of Rockwall. The survey was $2,300. The earnest money was $7,000. And the uh, buyer is not going to do the deal. And the buyer is going to have to pay for the survey because the choice in 6C2 was 6C2, but it was a very short time frame in 6C2, much shorter time frame than it should have been. Uh, give yourself time because... Uh, well, we can sometimes negotiate if your buyer gets a survey, uh, so you got a new survey there, and if there are valid reasons why they can't do the deal and the seller's okay with it, then often you get the seller to reimburse the buyer for the cost of the survey. A lot of variables there, but you try to do that. Um, but when you're saying that, so when you say, well, which choice do we make? Say, well, who do we represent? Well, we represent the seller. Oh, well, then we want to be 6C2. I think a seller should never give up an existing survey. There's at least one case, it goes back a number of years, um, and it got to the appellate level in which they found a seller with liability for giving up a survey. Really? Because the buyer said the seller represented certain things about the property with this survey. The seller assured us by giving us the survey that there were certain things and the survey was wrong. And it was an existing survey, so there was no recourse against the surveyor uh, from the buyer. Uh, the seller later ended up suing the surveyor for a different situation. Uh, but but that, that, that's the only case that I'm familiar with, but it was enough to make me cautious. I think a seller shouldn't give up an existing survey. I think a buyer should never accept an existing survey. Because uh, one, a buyer has no recourse against the surveyor. It's totally wrong. Uh, I think it's a problem. I think a buyer needs a new survey. And, and in most cases, residential deals in town, of course, are four or five hundred. 
Perfect. Well, you just offered 10,000 more than the list price and you're worried about $400 for a survey? Come on. It makes it a more attractive offer if you check off 6C2 as the buyer where the buyer is going to obtain a new survey. That just makes it a better offer. And so when you ask a question like that, we're going to say, well, who do we represent? Because it's going to be a different answer based on who we represent as you work through it. Um, so that, that would be a that would be a good example of making sure that we who we know who we represent makes a big difference in what we're doing there. Anything else in dealing with who we represent that we ought to be aware of, think about it? Anything you guys? We think. Because you ask that, don't you? I mean, if it, it's almost gotten to the point, we've talked about this enough. When I have agents come in, my officer, quick question, they go, the first thing I said, we represent self. Okay, good. Good start. We're trainable, love. We are trainable. We're coachable. <laughs> That's true. Do you have a question, Yeah. Yeah. Uh, if we uh, uh, represent buyer, we get the existing survey. What, what we should know? Okay, now say, say if, we, if we represent the buyer, what? Um, we get the existing survey. But what, what we need to notice about a survey? The, okay, the good survey question. So she says, we represent a buyer, we get an existing survey. What do we need to notice about the survey? Nothing. 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 Okay. Nothing. I'm serious. You're not a surveyor. You have no expertise in surveys. You don't review the survey. You make sure your buyer has it. You let your buyer take a look at it. Uh, you don't interpret a survey. You don't look at it and say, wow. Wow, look at all those easements. And I've never seen that many easements. You, know, you, don't, you don't do that because now you're representing something about a survey that you have no expertise under your license to do that. Now, if your buyer is going to go ahead and say, well, I want to save a few hundred dollars and so I want sellers got to get a survey and it's only a couple of years old, so it should be okay. In 6A8, survey exception. And you've got a copy of the contract there so you can look at that if you want to. <clears throat> the buyer should amend the exception because the title company has nine exceptions to the title insurance policy in paragraph 6A. They have nine exceptions. Exception number eight is the survey. And what the title company is saying to the buyer, you'll notice when you get your title insurance policy, there's this area in there called exceptions, standard exceptions. And number eight is the survey. If there's a mistake on the survey, don't call us. We can't help you. That's an exception. You have no coverage for survey. Unless you do that thing title companies love the most, you pay us money. Then we will amend that exception and we'll cover the survey, we'll cover for mistakes on a survey because you'll pay us a premium. You'll pay us at it's a line item in the settlement statement. And the current cost for residential is 5% of the premium. So if the title policy costs, if the title policy costs $2,000, it would cost the buyer $100 to amend the exception. And, and it's rare for the seller to pay for it. Buyer make a track of offer, buyer just pays for it, not a big deal. Now, if there is a mistake on the survey, because you've done this amendment, you can now file a claim with the title company. Because remember, on existing surveys, you have no recourse against the survey because it wasn't done for you. So you could file a claim with the title company. So I think that a buyer, if they, if they are accepting existing, existing survey, should always do that amendment to the exception. They should always do that. Um, now, that's on a residential transaction. If it's a commercial transaction, it's 15%. Your buyer is buying under an LLC, it just became commercial. So you got investor buyers buying under his LLC. That's now a commercial transaction. And so that $100 just became $300. You need to understand that little distinction as you work through it. Question on that? So we see how as you work, does that answer yours and going through it? Um, no. Okay, so just say it again then. Yeah. So, so for the buyer getting existing survey, what was your question? Oh, yeah, this. Oh, you should answer it. Good. Yeah. Now, uh, the, other, the other thing on existing surveys, by the way, so you represent the buyer and you make an offer, and in 6C1, you've got a blank there for existing survey. Uh, for how long we're gonna give the seller to provide the existing survey and the affidavit. That's to be notarized. And don't ever let the title company commit you. Oh, we do that at close. Oh, no, no, no. Um, you want a reasonable time frame in there? Three days, five days, something like that. Because you wanna get it pretty soon. You wanna get it pretty quickly. 
the, to me, the only real exception for longer than that, the seller says, you know, we do have an existing survey. Um, it's out at the farm and we're not going to go out to the farm until next week and get it. So we need 10 days. So there's a reason for needing a little bit longer. Or maybe sell us I travel a lot and I'm going to get that affidavit done until. So sometimes there, uh, there's not a reason to sell side, fairly short period of time, five days, something like that. Uh, now, that's how much time a seller has to do that. Existing survey, T47. Buy that to the buyer and buyer and talk about. If they don't do it in that time frame, buyer gets a new survey. Seller pays for it. Got to provide it to the buyer in only three days prior to closing. You got to look at that situation in every transaction to decide what else is going on and how far you go with that. So you got the buyer and, and you've got three days in that blank. It's the fourth day now and you don't have the existing service or the T47. And now the buyer has a right to a new survey that the seller's gonna pay for. But look at what else is going on in the transaction. You may have already gotten a sense, you may have already done an inspection, you've got a sense there's gonna be a lot of repairs you have to negotiate for. This would be the wrong time to get the seller's nose out of joint. Have a conversation, say, you know what, let's, let's make an investment here. Let's invest $400 in a new survey and let's make sure they understand what we're doing here, create a good relationship, we kind of move forward. So you, the agent, need to look at the big picture and see how you might want to move forward and give someone an opportunity to just not automatically just slam the door and say, okay, fourth day, a new survey, get it done. And work through. Yes, sir. Yeah. So we're, we've got the buyer in a situation like this where we noticed that they did not supply the affidavit. Um, the seller didn't. And the survey was there. The affidavit was not. <clears throat> it's a nine-year-old survey. But we did not sign an appraisal waiver. And the appraisal came in low. So... We are not bringing up anything having to do with that survey just yet because we are trying to work that situation first yeah. before we get there. So that's the big picture the agent has about working another important issue in the transaction that may way overshadow the survey issue. And, and you got to be able to do that. You know, your knowledge of all that really makes a huge difference as you work through that. Uh, you, you, you just you got to know that. I mean, you just have to understand all the pieces as you negotiate, take this thing from contract to closing, you gotta look at all the moving pieces. And, and you're gonna always operate under the advice of your, your client, but they're not gonna know. They're gonna say, oh, I, I, I'm talking to my friends, quote unquote friends, <laughs> who tell me this is how all this works. I get a new survey now, don't I? Yeah, technically, yeah, let's, let's talk about it. Let's see what we're gonna have to do. So we can see how really important it is on the seller and buyer side of representation and work through the challenge. Uh, it's an even greater challenge when we even if we've done the, the intermediary correct, one agent represents the seller, another agent represents the buyer. Um, that's a real challenge. So when you call us up and you say, okay, uh, I represent the buyer, and one of our other agents represents the seller, and we confirm you did it right in meter wise with appointments, it's okay. So now let's look at your question. And even though we're in an intermediate relationship, what the hotline will do, what I'll do when you call me the quick question, we go through it. We will still treat that buyer as our client. And those decisions be made to the benefit of that client, even if it's against the interest of the other client that we also represent. Uh, because you represent the buyer, you have it with the buyer, and these decisions be made for that buyer. You have the ability in an intermediate relationship under the rules to track when appointments have been made to do things for your client, even against the interest of the client on the other side, as long as you don't violate anything like confidentiality, uh, you can work through and do that. Um, but because we know that, it's not going to dilute uh, the efforts that we have to the client that you call about. Now, what happens in the real world, in the small world we're in, and, and you probably had it, I know I've had it, where agent A comes in and she said, okay, I rep buyers and intermediary, and by the way, Susan Kito represents the seller. And so we go through down, so here's what y'all do and so forth. And then 30 minutes later, Susan Q comes in, who represents the seller, and starts asking questions as we kind of work through and deal with that. And when we get to have that conversation, the, the advantage that we've got. Chit chat. What happened? Oh, chat. Oh, we got some things here. Would you click on the two? 
Oh, sorry, Christina, could you put a little chat button? Oh, she, she like somebody, somebody, somebody may have said something. <laughs> Charles okay. Kramer has helped me for five years. Very helpful. Never seems to put off even calling after hours or weekends. Good. Thank you. Great comment. Anything else? Okay. Uh, so the, the advantage you've got when you're talking to me or them is we understand the confidentiality situation. And when I talked to our first agent coming in, represent the buyer, and our second agent came in, represent the seller, everything we talk about is confidential. That's one of the absolute rules of the Real Estate Commission on intermediate relationships. So what happened there, as we go through back and forth with us, uh, we do it with respect for confidentiality. And that's, that's a very important thing of how we work through that. Uh, anything else on the uh, who we represent before we get to the next one? Are you in a contract mode or are you still in an offering mode? I, I realize, I recognize, I know it up front. I know you're tired of hearing me, brother. You say, Bob, we got this contract. I say, is it a contract or an offer? Because it's a world of difference. <laughs> I mean, it, what, what, she, she's a sweetheart. She's a good agent. She said, well, Bob, uh, what's the difference? We got to, no, there's, there's a difference. <laughs> so try to use it right, but it's hard because it's universal. I mean, 90% of people in the business say contract and what they mean is an offer. It's not an offer. It's not a contract. So everything is different. So we need to know, are you asking for good information, good advice, and you're in the offering process? What kind of things do you get when people are asking about the offering process? <laughs> Everything. I, mean, I, I have people who will ask me if I'll review their offer before they send it, which I'm happy to do. Sure. Um, they will ask, you know, what am I supposed to put in this blank? Which is not always the quickest response, just depends on what the blank is. You know, there's just, it just varies. So when we ask questions about a blank, what goes in the blank? What we need for you to understand. Is it depends. What does your client want? Yeah. What, <laughs> what, what, what needs to be there? What are the variables that we deal with as you go through it? Uh, and, and so as we go through it, it says, you know, we're not just going to give you a blanket answer. So well, here's what always goes there, because that may not be the case in that situation. She you through it. So but we've got to look at the variables. So what do you get? Uh, kind of the same thing. I mean, if, if it's on the other side, we received this offer and it's got this in it, which I feel like is unusual blank, whatever that mm -hmm. is. Mm -hmm. So then you have to walk through, okay, well, do you know if that was intentional or not from the other side? If it was, is this somebody trying to do a weasel clause yeah. kind of thing to get out? Or is this just a mistake? And then will it matter if it's a good enough offer? Say you have multiple, but this one's fantastic. And then you've got this one thing in it that looks squirrely. Well, what are the ramifications if you just leave that as it is because the seller just wants to take it? And then you have to walk down that road. That it, but okay, so a good example on that is a manager or HOA event, manager home association. Yep. 90 deals, 95 deals, A1 is checked off. As it's common, that's just normal. Got a number of days in there for the seller to provide the subdivision information, which includes a resource there to the buyer. Just on the standard. But because of recent things that have happened and new awareness that we have, uh, we're finding good buyers say, Maybe a two or a three is, and you've got the addendum right there in your packet. Maybe a two a a two or a three. Maybe that's a better choice. Now, he's, he's a good guy. He's one of our good agents. He had he had to sell it. He said, Bob, I got this offer, and he checked it off a three. What are they trying to pull? What's going on here? Because as Dick points out, was different. Was unusual. And we went through it, we talked about it, and said, well, that, that's actually good for my seller. Yeah, it really is. I mean, it's, a difference. it's not that automatic termination that you want. It's, it's a little different situation. He said, wow. So if you as a buyer on the buyer side are going to do something like that, be prepared to explain to the other side, especially to help them understand how this benefits their seller. You go through it and deal with it. Uh, to the, for example, if you put check off A4, Buyer doesn't require the subdivision information. Need to make sure you've checked off the proper box in paragraph D of that addendum because 
if a buyer doesn't require the subdivision information for the resale certificate, title company's going to require it. Title company says we didn't know who's going to pay for it. And so we'll make sure that you've done that. When you do something that's a little outside the norm, be prepared to help the other side say it, especially if you're an agent, if you've got the buyer and they're doing things out of the norm that really help the seller, make sure you're able to explain it to them and says, yeah, here's how this works. This is why the buyer is doing it. This is how it helps your seller. Yep. So that, that communication, obviously, in the cases I was talking about, was not coming from the buyer's side. They just checked it and sent it without any explanation at all. So, yep. And so, Scott, what are you seeing in, in things where, uh, you know, we're, we're working through and making sure that we're dealing with uh, questions in the offering phase? Well, uh, just to tag on that point, uh, you know, if you're, the, if you're the listing agent and the buyer's agent writes that type of information, it's confusing. It's, it's always a good idea just to seek to understand what, what, what are you trying to accomplish here? Uh, have that buyer's agent explain to you what their particular goal is. This might be their first deal and they have no idea what they're doing. So it's a great opportunity to just help understand the process. And frankly, it builds a better relationship with the agent on the other side if you can kind of help them through that process. Uh, you know, probably one of the biggest things that I see is agents trying to uh, <clears throat> write law, which I know, Bob, is one of your favorite things. Oh, yeah. It's so, a hobby I am. Uh, yeah. <laughs> and, uh, you know, uh, agents trying to put information in the contract that there's a form for. So, you know, it's an amendment form, whatever, and they're trying to just put it in special provisions. So I, I've, I've seen that quite a bit on the calls I've gotten. Yep. Perfect. So past the offering stage, we're now in a contract. So you're going to make a call to the hotline and your client buyer seller is in a contract. What kind of things are you seeing in that situation? Well, I mean, just a real quick, that quick one that I just want to make a reminder of once the, once it is a contract, you can only change it with an amendment. You cannot go back and change anything on the contract and initial it after it's a contract. So please don't do that. <laughs> yeah, you know, we, we, we don't. I mean, we see this sometimes with a backup contract that the backup moves in the first position. We have an amended effective date that all the performances that are tied to the effective date are tied to the amended effective date. There's a tendency, well, okay, my backup is now in the first position. So October 25th is now the amended effective date. So we need to go into the contract and change it. No, no. As Nick just pointed out, once we have an executed contract, do not go back in and do anything. Thank you. Thank you. And just stay with it. Got it. You just can't do that. It's got it. It's laminated. Yeah. It, it's laminated. You can't go in and change anything. You can't work through it. Kind of looks like you have a question. Yeah. Oh, you oh, for the backup contract. Thank you. Thank you for being here. I'm a seller's agent. How many backup I could get? Okay. So, backup contract, and it's a great question. There's a trek promulgated backup contract addendum that can be used for the first position and the first position only. There's no legal limit to how many backup contracts the seller can be in, but all the rest have to be prepared by an attorney. The trek addendum can only be used for the first backup position because that's the language on that. Yeah. And I uh, have another question about it. Also, about backup contract. If I represent a buyer, um, the uh, the buyer signed the backup contract for another house, but as well as, as, well as he, he was hunting another house. Um, so he wants to be in backups on multiple houses? Yeah, okay. uh, if a buyer signed yeah. up the backup contract, but-, uh, but he, Backup offer? Yeah, backup offer. But he, he don't know is, is that he could just get that house. house. So, he as well as uh, he hunting another house. Yep. If okay. if they if he put another offer to another house as well as the another house listing agent call 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 me, uh, my I could get in that house to back up offer. I is that I just lose the if if my buyer would uh, give up the first house. Okay, so let's look at the scenario. 
if you're in an offering situation. So the buyer makes an offer, there's already a contract on the property. Mm -hmm. So their offer is going to be with the backup contract addendum, which is in your packet here. So it's a backup contract addendum. At that point, it's an offer. And your buyer says, you know, I don't know if I want to accept it or not. So I want to look at other properties. Yeah. Fine. You've got to make a judgment call on how good your buyer is, how committed they are. Or are they just going to keep looking and keep looking and keep looking until mm -hmm. they find the end all be all? You've got to be you seriously. You've got to make a judgment call. How far are you willing to go with this buyer? How many, how many offers are you willing to make with them? But let's say their first offer on with the backup contract mm -hmm. gets accepted. Now, you should know, and we've got it in our intranet, we've got that, that actual process on splitting up the earth's money and the option fee. So when your buyer makes an offer on, with the backup contract addendum, uh, and let's say they're going to do a $200 option fee, right now they're only going to pay $10. They'll pay the $190 when they back up becomes the first. So right now, the cost for the buyer and this first backup contract is $10. So if they want to continue to go out and look at other houses and you made the judgment call that you understand the reason and these are good buyers and you're okay with that, then if they get into another property, they say, oh, I just want to make an offer on it too because it's also going to be a backup yeah. again. So all along as they do this, their risk is that $10 for the option fee. And they're able to end up into multiple as it work. Now, once their contract, their backup goes into the... <laughs> You've got to really make sure you pay attention to their timelines because when that backup goes to the first position, then now I have to pay the rest of that option fee and the earnest money. So you need to help protect them, make sure they understand their obligation on that. Uh, I, I can tell Nick has got a comment before I go home. No, yes, ma'am. And then you would also, for any other backups that they put out, if they're only going to be purchasing one property, you need to put in terminations, don't you? What does that what do you mean for the termination? If they had if they had backups they in contracts? On other, several other properties. So are they in contracts or in the offer stage? If, if they made a backup offer. But they're not yet, it's not accepted they're not the yet contract. Accepted, but withdraw. You withdraw, you withdraw the offer. We have That's a right. contract. Yes. Yeah, we have yes. a form. I'm sorry, wrong, wrong yeah. terminology. So we have a form and take real form. You do form. need to take that out. You withdraw it. You withdraw the offer. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> That's form. So you've got to be done in writing. That way, now, bottom line though, is if they somehow forget to do it and they don't do it in time and all of a sudden they got two or three backup con backup offers accepted, their risk is $10 for every one of those. Quickly terminate and move on. Uh, and so you'll be able to help them kind of work through and do that. So it's it's really important as you're going through, uh, you know, once, once we've got a contract, we don't have any new rights, any new responsibilities for either party once we have a contract. You can't make <coughs> anything that wasn't agreed to in the original contract. I has no rights that are not in the original contract. You have no rights to terminate. I mean, the seller, for example, unless it's in the original contract, cannot be required to do any repairs. Now, the deal may fall apart. Buyers and say, hey, you got to do this, this, and we need a roof. And then, so they no. Well, then we don't make the loan. Okay. Next. And no obligation. And we need to understand that. Because once we have a contract, as we begin to do what Nick talked about, start negotiating repairs and all this stuff with amendments, with a trick from getting amendment form. If we go through the process of trying to negotiate with an amendment and we're not successful with the amendment form, we don't get mutual agreement or everybody signed off on it, what we still have is the original contract. It's still in place. Just not, you know, buyer says, well, I'm going to terminate because I asked for all these repairs and the seller's not going to do it. Well, that's not a basis for termination. Sorry about that, but seller doesn't have to do any of it unless it's in the original contract. So once we've got a contract, we need to understand the obligation of the parties and they need to understand their obligation, understand the timelines of what's going on as you work through. Comments on that? Questions on that? Um, just that when you're a backup, can you become the primary a lot of your dates, unless you've done it, say your close date's 30 day post amended effective date, you're gonna to have to go back and change those with an amendment. Um, <laughs> if there's then, you know, you add in a lease back or something like that, you have to do that with an amendment. You know. Yeah, absolutely. You know, so if, if you have all those things decided all the time, just, just 
just go back through Bob's point, the original contract that your client is bound to and make sure that all of the terms are still acceptable to everybody. And if they aren't, then you begin the negotiating process to get them to an acceptable term. Yeah. But the seller's under no obligation to do that. Because one of the things that you'll do on a backup when you're making an offer, it's a backup offer. In paragraph nine, the closing date, you'll probably put something like 20 days after the amended effective date. Because, you know, you don't know when the first one might go away. So you put a date in there, you may find yourself with, you know, the first one went away and now you've only got you know, 10 days to perform everything. So a number of days after the amended effective date. Scott, you want to add something to that? what we just talked about of once we're in the contract phase and we have questions dealing with what's happening in the contract? No, I, other than to say that's, I mean, to me, that's the beauty of the option period is because there are times when a buyer does want to go under a contract on, or excuse me, in a backup position on multiple, uh, in multiple properties. And as you say, Bob, they can do that. You just have to be very careful and make sure, first of all, Make sure that you know when you've been notified by the primary agent that you are now in a primary position. You just have to be careful that uh, you don't miss that somehow, and uh, you're not. You don't know you're in a primary position. Yeah. So I, I think it's all I would add to what you were saying, because yeah. that has happened on occasion, not to us, but to you know some agents. Yeah. Some some friends you have may have done it. No, actually, this time it really hasn't happened to us. Not yet, anyway. <laughs> okay, uh, so let's look at the next question. Is the document question, uh, is this a document question? Have you read all the appropriate documents? Clarify your question. What we're doing with this, and remember, these are questions you're asking yourself before you call the hotline. So, uh, is this something that addresses one of the documents, paragraph in the contract, something in addendum, and have you read it? Don't not read it. Say, well, I don't have to read it. I'm going to call Nick and he's here giving the answer. You need to read it. <laughs> because, guys, we're not going to beat up on you. We're not going to say things. But it's embarrassing when you ask a question and the answer is right there in paragraph B of the backup contract addendum. You clearly haven't read it. I go, well, it's embarrassing. And, and you know what? At some point in time, and it, it won't apply to anyone in this room, we'll remember that you never read the documents and you're not in my classes. And frankly, at some point in time, this may not be the right place for you. Uh, and I'm glad Mike's left the room because I get in a lot of trouble when I <clears throat> run people off. <laughs> it gets me all kinds of trouble uh, as you work through that. But you, you really, you just got to, you've got to read it. Now, having said that, I understand there are no paragraphs in the contract or any addendum that are absolute black and white and only one interpretation. I understand that. But at least you need to have read it. What? So that sounds like a challenge. <laughs> You need to at least have read it and have an interpretation that you've come up with. You need to be able to have done that as you work through it. Um, because otherwise, you know, so please take your time and read it as you go through it. Uh, more, and, more than once, actually. Read it uh, two or three times. Oh, 10 or 12 times. Yep. You're absolutely right. M multiple times. And, and when you read it, ask questions. Occasionally, I, I'll do a class or I'll have an it will be the whole class, and we'll do a proactively reading the contract. And the, the paragraph that lately that I've done is paragraph 2B of the third-party financing addendum. Or in the class, I have you read it and then be prepared to answer questions about that paragraph. And uh, what's interesting is, you know, you sit there and you take about three minutes and you read it. It's about all it takes to read it. And then we look at the question. I got four or five questions on it. And they were variable answers. There were people class said, well, here's what it says. And so, no, it doesn't say that. Because uh, a lot, we look at things and there are a lot of there are myths. There are assumptions about what we think it says. Just kind of work through that. Uh, that so brings up a, a good point. And I know Marsha, I've heard her tell other people this. And we've said it in class. And I know you have too. When you do have questions after you read it, 
make sure you call us if you still don't understand it, as opposed to maybe somebody else that you happen to be sitting next to. Yeah, in the computer room. They had their license five stuff. minutes later, longer than you. Yeah. They might have the right answer, but just in case, I, you know, I think Bob would be more comfortable with us fielding those questions. Yep, absolutely. Oh, uh, and, and, it, and it's not that we're not being helpful with each other. I understand that. Um, but when it's an important issue, you need to go to the resources. You need to go to the hotline. You need to go to me, Mark, and you need to get that information. Um, question number five here. If it's a procedure question, and a procedure question comes in places like with offers, comes in like negotiating repairs and other kinds of things, uh, after we've got a contract, uh, you really need to know what your client wants to do. And, and, and it's not a good answer. When I say, what's your client want to do? Well, uh, they'll just say whatever we tell them. Or they don't know, they're just asking, they're looking to us for answers. But many times you'll have a client and, and they can't make a decision. They say, you know, that's why we got you. We're trusting you to come up with an answer. Um, and the reality is <clears throat> you can't answer. You can't answer for them. Uh, you really do need to know. You, you got to drill deep with them and say, you know, what's your, what's your objective? We got, you know, uh, got a closing coming up and, and all of a sudden, you know, uh, the buyer didn't want to close and uh, you've got the seller and you, you call us up and say, hey, here's the deal. We're supposed to close in two days and the buyer's told us they're not going to close. What do we do? I said, well, what does your seller want to do? Well, a seller wants to close. And I said, that's not enough. Well, a seller wants to close. But yeah, we understand. But, you know, let's talk about the variables. Let's talk about the options. Let's talk about when they understand all things. Now, in cases like that, any kind of a serious performance issue that relates to a final closing is always an attorney question. It's always an attorney conversation. And I say, yeah, okay, well, let's, 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 let's let you have a talk with Charles or Kelly or Don Moore or someone like that. You know, let's go through that process. Would you restate that? I don't know which one. Anytime you have a performance <laughs> question that deals with the final performance of the contract, such okay. as a closing. Okay, so I see what you're saying. Neither party says, I'm not going to close. <clears throat> And, and, and we have this with investors a lot who have been able to negotiate a contract without a big earnest money. And if an investor says, you know, now that we take a look at this, it's just not worth it. Uh, and, and, and they may not even have done an option. They say, Where's, you know, here's the 500, keep it, and we're going to move it on. It's a lot cheaper for us to give a 500 and to waste our time and money on this deal. Um, and so, you know, they work and so it's okay. So, so you got you got the buyer and the buyer says, yeah, I'm, you know, I'm going to, or maybe you got the seller and you just found out the investor buyer is going to walk away and give you the earnest money. Uh, and the seller says, well, I'm going to sue them. Well, that's an attorney conversation. Uh, you could. I will, will tell you my experience over many, many years and in too many courts. <coughs> attorney, uh, the judges don't like to, to, they're not going to make a buyer buy a property because there are too many reasons a buyer cannot buy the property. You know, you have a situation and the seller sues a buyer for specific performance, requiring the buyer to come and buy the property. And that's the ruling of the judge. And the buyer says, the judge says, buyer, you've got to buy this property. The buyer says, judge, I'd love to. And we love the property. <laughs> Us, we still have any money. You know, we're, 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 we're total broke. We got nothing. The judge says, well, it doesn't matter. My, my read here is that you've got to buy the property and seller, you've got to give them the deed. And we're gonna we're gonna have a judgment for you in favor of you against this buyer because they gotta buy the property. And the buyer just got a deed to the property, and the seller's got a piece of paper. It's not any money because he sued the buyer for specific performance, and the judge is not gonna make the buyer buy. It's just not gonna happen. It's, it's the reverse of that. The judge is not gonna make a seller sell the house. Out of, a, out of a thousand cases, that didn't happen once. Maybe twice. It just doesn't happen. Judges like for people to pay money. They're not going to make people do that. You say, pay some money. You know, here are the damages. Here's the money. Get a judgment against them and then enforce the judgment. Um, it'll always be an attorney question. We're not going to say, oh, don't sue. It'll be a bad suit. I mean, particularly, particularly in today's environment. Uh, I mean, in, in a normal suit, certainly in Dallas County and certain to a degree in, uh, in Denton, I mean, in, in Colorado, it's going to take a year, a year to get to court. When I look at the lawsuits we got right now, I don't have any lawsuit that we haven't had going on. The, the oldest one I got right now, 
a um, year and a half. And we still don't have a, a date scheduled for, for our court. Judges are just too busy. They have too many things going on. They're not going to schedule, especially until they've seen you go through a few mediations to try to resolve things. Uh, so it's going to be hard for you to get any time there. And all that time, Sawyer's house is tied up and he's going to end up with nothing. So it's a bad situation. And it is tied up through the whole lawsuit then. Yeah, we have a whole lawsuit. It, they can't show it. They yeah, can't. it would. Yeah, it can't do anything. Now, he, if he tried to sell it, which is, it's a legal question, but we try to sell it, he's going to have to tell every buyer, my ability to make title to you is subject to resolving this lawsuit, which could happen the next year or two. So buyers got me business said, you know, I, okay, we just want to be in line. Whenever we get it resolved, we want to buy the house. Maybe in our lifetime, we'll see. It made me think of something that with the earnest money, that we should never tell our clients, you will get the earnest money if this happens or if that happens. Because even if the contract says that they are entitled to it, things happen. People have to agree and sign the release of earnest money. You know, sides get mad at each other and decide they're going to hold out, and, you know, just to make the other side more mad. So you just have to be really careful that you don't say you will. Nothing definite. By the terms of the contract, it appears you might, but not you will. In a contracts class I was doing earlier today on Zoom for CCAR for that three-hour class we do, we were talking about the earnest money. And it's an important point because there are three factors in the release of earnest money. One is where's the contract say? And in most places, the contract says, this happens, refund goes to the buyer. Buyer gets earnest money. So we look at what the contract says, what the addendum says. Then we look at the actions of the parties. Probably the most typical one I see is buyer approval, paragraph 2A of third party financing data. Buyer doesn't get his approval or he doesn't feel like he can get his approval uh, within the number of days in 2A. And so he sends termination over to the buyer, or to the seller. And then the seller says, you know what? We accepted your offer because you had this great letter from your lender. You're way approved. Uh, your lender called us and gave us all kinds of glowing statements about you and how you were wonderful and Everybody loved you and you know, all that kind of stuff. And now you're saying that you can't qualify and you're going to terminate. So it says, not only are we not signing a release, we're going to sue you. Which gets to the third factor on release for earnest money, and it's the policy of the title company. And the title company says, and the title company says, by the way, that's who has the earnest money. Yeah. They say, until this is resolved, there's a dispute this money's not going anywhere. We may eventually interplead it to the courts, but it doesn't go anywhere until everybody signs off on a release. So to, to Marsha's point, we need to make sure our buyer, and that's typically who we get the question from, understands, one, we don't have the earnest money. We have no control over the earnest money. We don't have anything to do about the release of the earnest money. Here are the factors. Here's how you might get or don't get it. Because when a buyer says, okay, uh, if I don't get a loan approval, that 5,000 earnest money, I can get back, right? It'd be a terrible mistake for you to say, oh yeah, because then when they don't get it back, guess who they're looking to for the $5,000? They're looking to Larry. <laughs> Good luck. Because he was... <laughs> <laughs> the, no, Bob, I asked all my hard questions to Marsha, so this is what she told me. Yeah. Uh, so, mm -hmm. Now, number six here. Please do this. Please do this. These are all important criteria. Every transaction, these are important. If you've got a seller and he's trying to decide which offer to take, these are important. And they're important that is, if we've got a transaction, you've got to call with a, with a question, let us know, who do we have here? Who's the other agent? Who's the title company? Who's the lender? Who do we have? What's going on? Is this appropriate? Now, it may not be a question that you can do with the inspector, so that may not be a factor. Um, why is it important for us to know who the agent is and who their company is? Why is that an important factor today? Uh, well, because it could be an agent that already has a history of, of being tough to deal with. Yeah, we've had bad experiences with them. Or it could be the other opposite, too. They could be an amazing agent, so it's more of a clarification as to what's going yeah. on versus miscommunication. Yeah. Or what else? It could be an agent and a company that, that we're good friends with. Mm -hmm. And when I have a challenge in a transaction, there's something going on, uh, and with certain companies, I know the brokers really well, and so it's a better situation. I can call the broker up and say, "Here's what we have. Let's work together. What we can do." Now, it's also the other side of that is there. 
there's some companies that it's not going to help for me to be involved at all because I don't have a good relationship with the broker. In fact, we've been to court. <laughs> it's not going to work. Uh, but knowing who the agent is, knowing who the company is, can really make a difference. There's sure a number of companies out there that when it happens, we're in much better shape because I know we can have the conversation. We may not always agree on the solution, but we can have the conversation. Our client can see we're trying to do something to resolve everything. Uh, same thing with the lender, who the lender is. Now, I don't like online lenders. Lenders. I don't like Rocket Mortgage. You know, I don't like all those other big companies that are online. I don't even, USAA is my insurance company. I don't like USAA. They're not a good mortgage company. No, they're not. Uh, Navy Federal Credit, not a good company. Uh, I like someone local so that if I push come to show. I'm just making sure nobody's on there that's not supposed to be. Go ahead. Yeah, I just want to make sure I didn't get in trouble on that comment. Uh, I, want, I want to get a local lender so I can go and knock on their door and say, hey, let's talk about this. It's such a difference. It's, it's that physical presence to me is really important. Um, and, and there's there's some of the, I mean, if it's any of the big ones, the Bank of America, the Chase, you know, the, some of those, and I just, you're pulling your hair. I say, oh my gosh. You know. And so who the lender is, is huge. Uh, in fact, as a seller, when you're looking at multiple offers and, and, and you see, you know, one of them is Fairway, maybe Highland, another great lender. Um, give me a lender that you like to use a lot, local lender. Uh, yeah, Umbridge. Chris Pittman. Umbridge. SWBC. 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 No. Yeah. Those are all good. Good local. Uh, and if seller looking at it, okay, this is a really good offer. Yeah. And uh, who's the lender? Chase. Oh, okay. Is, is that a problem? Well, they rarely ever close their deals on time. But other than that, it's not, no big deal. So, yeah. I mean, it's, it's, it's a real sign that some of these companies like that, People who work for them won't use them. <laughs> wow, that's a big red flag. Uh, so need to know who they are. Same thing with the title company. There are clear rules for title companies. Takes a part of insurance is, is a heavy headed regulator. But title companies are in their own world. They're going to do whatever they're going to do based on their advice of counsel. And when you begin to get a little bit out of the main area, oh my gosh, I mean, the, the stuff that title companies do or don't do is just, you know, and, and the reality is, you know, we can call them up, have some conversation, try to work through things, uh, but, but they're going to have their own opinion about things. You have to be careful. We have to help clients <laughs> understand you got a seller in multiple offers, and some of the title companies are ones we've never heard of. Some of these investors have their own title companies to do with all the business with and have no idea who they are. Some of them barely even have a local presence, and they're really just have a license here in Texas who they have to, but they're really in another state. That's tough. Uh, it's one of the reasons we sometimes have challenges with builder side companies because they're they're so favored on the builder. Uh, as you work through that, any comments on, on having to know <clears throat> who some of these people are? No, I think it's appropriate to know uh, to be able to set the expectation though. If you're in if you're in negotiation with uh, a buyer, a buyer's agent, and they have a company there or a seller and they've got that preferred in the MLS or whatever to know that um, if that's what it's going to take to get the deal done, that your buyer knows that going in. So we have one that's not with a closed door, but it's the opposite of closed door. <laughs> and not naming, not, naming, not naming names, but yeah. the title company is owned by them as well. Yep. Yes. And, or excuse me, affiliated. And um, that, that has raised issues. Raised Big and luckily for us, we, we did our job. We let the buyer know that this is going to be an issue throughout and we're going to do the best we can for you. But um, know that even though they did this wrong, they still may not face up to it and it could come back to you later. Just charges and things like that. Nick, but, I just recently had an experience with an offer from, you know, not a company by the name of Closed Store as well. Right. Their own in-house title company, yet they had three different amendments or addendum for not amendments, but addendum for us to sign that all seem to be catch 22s in favor of them that didn't leave us with any out if in case something should happen as the seller. Right. I mean, it was one of those things where everything was leaning towards them as the buyer. 
Right. Did you see that in your documentation sure. as well? Well, it's like, it's like a builder contract. And we can't say right <laughs> what those documents say, but we can read them and say, hey, buyer, make sure you read, read this. Give a legal opinion. Make sure you read this. Yeah. It kind of seems like it might be this. I'm not an attorney. I don't play one on TV. So if you want <laughs> real clarification <laughs> of what this is, talk to an attorney. But if you read it and you feel like you're comfortable with it, you know, this is this These is how times when a good conversation with one of the telecom attorneys can happen. Yeah, this is how we get to close. This is how we get you the house. It's their ball. It's their rules. This is how it's going to work. And you need to be fully comfortable with that, or we just need to move on to the next house. My seller declined. They went in with a different offer. Your what? My seller declined the closed door offer. Oh, okay, yeah. Too many catch twenty twos. Too many op options for excuse me. Too many exits for the buyer to leave and still obtain their earnest money, even though that looked questionable yeah. in their addendum. Sure. So we went with something <clears throat> a little bit more comfortable. Well, did you have something, Marjorie? We'll talk to you no, I'm just, I was just thinking that, you know, you just have to be really careful the way words matter, right? Yeah. So the way that you say things is really important. You know, if you have a multiple offer situation, you have the seller, you probably don't want to say, don't go with them because that title company sucks. Not a good idea, not real professional and not very good. Because you know what? Every once in a while, there may be somebody who is really good affiliated with that title company or with that, you know, whatever brokerage. So you just have to be really careful. You can say, in my experience, you know, I haven't always had successful, you know, transactions because of this company, yeah. this company. But just it's so they have a right to your to to benefit from your set of experiences without stepping over the line, but but the point is, any type of an institutional buyer or seller, your client needs to know you're going to jump through more hoops, lose a few rights. Uh, it's going to be a more challenging circumstance. This includes reload companies because they have requirements, they have situations in there, and your client just needs to understand there are going to be some challenges there uh, to, that they're going to have to deal with. You're going to be able to work through the process. Um, and, and, you know, it's just they do need to know um, that in, in an already complicated transaction, when you throw a couple of elements like that into the deal, uh, it really creates a challenge. And I know we, we can't say things about agents. No, can't say bad things about agents. However, <laughs> in my notes, in my contacts, when I've done a deal with somebody, I save their name, save their phone number, and I'll say something like, horrible at communicating. So if it comes back up again, that's the company they work for, that's horrible at communicating. And I'll know that going in. So if I forget who somebody is, it's a nice way to kind of go, all right, well, I know what I'm getting into here. So, yeah, and that's it. And that's key. They make decisions about that. Scott, can you follow up on that? Yeah. Hey, uh, so, we, Barbara and I get sort of made fun of by agents that we mentor because we talk a lot about avoiding absolute statements. You know, we're, we're responsible to our clients to help them see the way forward. And so, we, we've got to help them. But we always have to be very careful not to use absolute statements, sort of like Marcia was mentioning, mentioning before uh, regarding time work. You know, we try to say things like, usually, most of the time, we use typically a lot. So we help our client understand what's normal and what's most common, but we don't put ourselves in a position of making a representation of something that we, we really can't do. So... Uh, like there, there are times when, you know, I'm, you know, five years later, I may have forgotten whether I said something or not. And if it's brought up, you know, I, I know, I just know that it's not something I would have said. I, I just know I would never have said that. And so if you, if you could just be consistent in that and being very careful about absolute statements. You do have to be careful because it's a smaller world than we think it is. And imagine if our business, if we had to do like the police where they have body cams and they were, in fact, recording everything we said or did. I mean, I can't imagine that in our business. I mean, that would, to me, that would yeah. stifle our creativity. <laughs> yeah. You know what? That's an agent that uh, I'm not going to say bad things about that agent. But if I were to say bad things, it's sort of it no, creative if you work through that to deal with it. Um, so um, now... It's part of all this, as we work through it, um, one of the things you, you have in your packet there is the addendum for public improve, paper, improvement districts and a two a two page extension thing from Dr. Blake Bennett, who spoke to us last week 
uh, on this. And it was it was a great class. Uh, he did a two-hour class. Uh, Dr. Blake Bennett, who is a professor at Texas A&M, is what I ran, remember. Um, yeah, and the Ag Extension Service. Uh, and, and one of the things that I really appreciated him saying about that, I mean, he gave some great information. Uh, and he got a lot of stuff on this two pages that you have here. He said, the thing you need to know about PIDs, it's a mess. And it is. Uh, I, I was visiting with, because uh, we, we, we talk about things that hear about payments and paying for it and all those things. Um, and I was talking with uh, Kelly Wall at uh, Republic Title, one of our favorite people. And you know, lots of great title companies around here and title company people, but she's just one of my favorites. And we were talking about this, and I, and I was because I'd ask Dr. Bennett the question because you have a PID, and and a, and a buyer who gets into a PID can pay it up front, or he can pay it over time. And so my question is: so if they pay it up front, and uh, so they because the PID can be financed over like twenty years, and they pay it up front, and then five years later they decide to sell the house, do they get this prorated back and they get a credit for it? Uh, or is it just paid and it's done? Or is it is it kind of like you pay something in advance, like owner's dues or tax or whatever gets prorated? And Kelly said, well, she said, you know, that's a really good question. I'd have to think through it. She said, we've never had it. We've never had anyone pay up front. They've always paid over time. And so it just rolls over to the next person. And they just continue to pay on time. Uh, it said, and so, so it says, if they do pay it off, when the next buyer comes along, they don't get to then change their mind and pay it out. I said, no, it's, it's gone because it's paid for. It's done. Um, and it has some interesting little challenges there as you work through it. Uh, he talked about the fact that in the city of Salina, uh, there, are, there are currently 13 PIDs. And they've just had 22 new PIDs uh, recommended to the city, which evidently are looking like being accepted. Now, when you go to the city of Salina, PIDs, go to their that website and pull it up and it goes to that, I just call Muni something. Uh, it has all the information. And it's got those current 13 in there. And it's got all the different information so forth on it. One of the first immediate things I look when I look at that says, I don't want us to ever as agents be involved in explaining that. <laughs> well, here's the total statement here. Here's the complete statement here. Here shows the fees. Here's where all the numbers are. Uh, here's what it's gonna cost you. Here's how it's gonna show up. And it, it tells you here, here's what it's for. It's for certain improvements, it's for this, it's for that, it's for whatever. Uh, what we do is we make sure our client knows it and they've got that information as we work through it. Now, here's what we need to understand, in, in my opinion. You know, we had a new thing that actually came out, started out in 2019, and Trek really pushed it into uh, the rules, the broker responsibility rules, 535.2, and it's geographic competence. And we primarily have dealt with the concept of geographic competency uh, being something that you need to know the area that you're going to represent a buyer or seller in. And we think about, gee, do I know Midlothian well enough to know, or is it just because just having the MLS stage is not enough? Well, the PID has brought in new dimensions. If you're going to have a buyer and you're going to show them properties in Salina where there are a lot of PIDs, that could really make a difference to a buyer whether they wanted this property or this property because this property has a pit and this one doesn't. The agent should know that. When you're listing a property, the listing agent should know that. So knowing about public improvement districts can become a geographic competency issue for buyers because the main reason we've got this addendum that the legislature came out with, it went into effect September 1st of this year, is there were people who got into trouble buying properties that there were PIDs and they didn't know about it. They also owing all this money and they complained to the legislature. And so the legislature said, oh, this is a problem we got to fix. And so we got to create this addendum a new language in the contract, which came effective September 1st. Uh, so it became an issue, which tells us it's going to become an even greater issue. It's going to be something that's going to happen more and more and more. And so we need to really address it. We need to know about it. We need to be aware of how you find out properties in a PID or not, where you have a seller or the buyer. You need to be on top of that. Because uh, this could be could be a real challenge. So I don't guess they have any pids up in uh, in Vail, do they? 
Uh, not that I know of. But <laughs> it's, always good, it's always good to ask that question. <laughs> Okay, we've covered a lot of stuff. We had some great information. I want to see if we have any closing statements from our fine panel here. Uh, Scott, we'll go ahead and start with you. Do you have any closing statements of things you want us, you want these people to really know that when they're going to call the hotline, and we and I agree with you, we absolutely encourage them to do it more and more. But when they do, any final statements about advice you want to give them on what they should be doing here? No, I, I think what you outlined, Bob, is exactly what is helpful to us to understand what the situation is. Um, so I can't really add anything to that, but again, I'll just reinforce, uh, please use the hotline. You know, if you're worried or thinking about it, you know, call us first. Don't wait until you get in a situation where maybe then it's hard to pull out of it. So the yeah. goal is for all of us is to stay out of Bob's office <laughs> and Mark's office too. Yeah. Permission rather than forgiveness. Yes, yes. No, that's hard, but permission rather than forgiveness. Because sometimes forgiveness, we can't. It's too late. So, Nick, any yeah. final closing statements? No. <laughs> okay, so Nick is speechless. I'm out. Take a picture of that. I'm out. I'm good. Everything I, I want to say, I said. Everything you said. Marcia? I would say um, don't apologize for calling us. Don't say, um, you know, I have to call you because Bob's not there. We're there so that Bob does, can have more time to work on the legal issues he needs to work on, and we're able to help you. And that's what we want to do. We want to help you, so you don't need to apologize. You don't need to say, this is a really stupid question. You don't need to preface any of that. If it's a stupid question, we'll figure it out. <laughs> it, it will just take us less time to help. That's it. That's yeah, okay. Feel okay calling because yeah. you really yeah. need to. And, and don't say when you call, don't say, Marsha, I got to call you because Bob's too busy. <laughs> Not good. <laughs> because I, I'm never too busy for you to be able to talk to us, work through it, and to deal with whatever it is we need to deal with. So please feel good about making the call and working through that because we really need for you to do that. Yes, ma'am. I was going to say for those newer agents that might be fearful of coming forward and asking questions, um, I've had an issue where I ended up going to Bob and he helped work me through it. Um, it's, it's never, I, I, I was never made to feel like I was ignorant. I was never made to feel like it was a, a stupid stunt. He talked me through it. He walked me through it and he showed me where in the future I could improve and, and be a better agent for it. And that's been a couple of years now. Thank you. And you're right, and that, that's that's how we want you to feel. We it was a learning to, experience. Yes, it is a learning experience. This is an incredibly valuable resource, and it's here for you. So you've got this. You know we've got your back. You can spend your time building your business and going through the process because, uh, you know, none of us, not Scott, not Nick, not Marcia, none of us are doing this because we don't have anything to do. <laughs> well, if they could just give me one more thing to occupy my time, that'd be great. Not there. We don't have anything that we work through on that. Uh, so please, we encourage you to do it. Yeah, make the calls. And just to echo that, we've been new agents and we learned and with the help of experienced agents and we continue to learn with the help of other agents. So do not be, do not be concerned about coming forward and asking questions. Okay, so uh, anything uh, final in 10 words or less? Colton Dominic, anything you guys want to say about all this good stuff we just talked about? Well, absolutely. No, I think y'all did a really good job of uh, being proactive and our reactive. We kind of like work the same way. We actually had a buyer who was going to be doing an appraisal waiver, and so we walked through the what if scenarios to make sure, you know, if anything were to happen. We have already disclosed, walked through. We, you can say you can break 50 grand of the table when you put those numbers on paper. It's a whole other <laughs> conversation. Yeah. So yeah. Uh, just being proactive with the lender, I think it's probably the best advice I can Perfect. Perfect. Okay, everybody, thank you very much for being here. We appreciate it. And uh, go out and have a great day and call the hotline. Plug that number into your phone. Thank you, Nick Marsh. appreciate it. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Yeah, turn it off. Close Thanks, it. Scotty. Thank you, Scott. Appreciate it. Thank, Thank you. you guys. Yeah. Thank you, Barbara, for letting Scott do this. <laughs>